Church, will you join me in welcoming the whole wide world to Open Door Church on a Wednesday night? Boom! Yay! Good job, everybody. Guys, open up your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3, everybody go, uh oh. Look at, oh yeah, look at, he's going to Revelation. Do not freak out. You need to love that book. I like that book. I guess it's just too scary. What I say to you, come on. You live in a scary world right now, I promise. And so, no, I'm, I'll tell you what, I'm looking for Jesus to come back. That's not some pie in the sky thing. That's not some, you know, it's not some crazy. Listen, it is basic Christianity 101. Jesus Christ is coming back. And I ain't giving that up. I ain't giving that up. Oh, you don't actually believe all that? Listen, I, listen, I'm crazy. I believe Jesus is actually resurrected from the dead. I mean, I actually believe that. And I believe that he showed up. And I believe he is God Almighty who became a human being. I believe that. And I believe his word is true. And I believe his promises are, are real. And I believe that he is trustworthy. And I believe he's coming back. And I want to tell you something. When he comes back the next time, he ain't coming back nice. He showed up the first time as a six-pound Jew. He's going to show up the second time as a king of kings and the lord of lords and the alpha and the omega, and he's going to deal with the enemy. And, and uh, I'm going to be riding with him. Brother Enoch, the seventh from Adam in the book of Jude, is recorded saying that he saw the Lord coming back with ten thousands of ten thousands and ten thousands of his saints. And we're talking about Enoch, who was only seventh generation from Adam, right? And the brother who didn't die, who just was not. You ever see somebody lost so much weight, they just were not? Jerry Sellers are like that. <laughs> that brother used to sit around a table all by himself. Now look at him. He's back here. He's laughing at my jokes, so y'all don't. All you girls in here, hey, nice, nice, quit it. He ain't a girl. Amen. He ain't. <laughs> so when, when boys really love each other, they berate one another. That's what they do. <laughs> so anyway, man, I, the brother lived to be 360 years old and then was not. Meaning he was, done, he was not what? He was not here. He was not found. <laughs> he was done. So what is 360, guys? It's full circle. Right? He went, he went full circle. He completed his walk with God. And there was no need for him to hang out in this space-time continuum any, any longer. Amen. And isn't it funny? He's the one who saw the return of King Jesus and how that the church was actually with him. Man, I like that. Well, in Revelation chapter 1, Brother John begins to speak from the island of Patmos, and it's just, you know, the book of Revelation is, is a very controversial book. I'm so glad it's in the Bible. I'm so glad. And, you know, you say, I, I, I say that, but there's been a fight, and there continues to be a fight about the book of Revelation to this day. And one of the big fights about the book of Revelation is, is, is this whole thing that John saw prophetically of the return of King Jesus, of the tribulation, of the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, and finally of the great white throne judgment. And I sure don't want to leave out the rapture of the church because that's definitely in there. Oh, that's something else too. Y'all don't want me to believe in anymore. I'll tell you what, I, I want to tell the millions of people watching, I ain't giving up the rapture. You're welcome to stay. I bless you in the tribulation. And you can have all that trash you want. I can call me a hillbilly. You call me backwards. And tell, I'm telling you right now, it is the word of God. I know what I'm talking about. It's, it's one of the big challenges of, of hanging out with so many Messianic Jews because they don't want, they don't want you talking about it. They don't like that. So why is it? Because Israel is so key during the tribulation. And so they just have a different calling. Okay, this Gentile believe in Jesus, lover of God Almighty is going to be raptured. And I ain't going through the tribulation. And if you want to go through the tribulation, you're welcome to go through it. Because I want to tell you, I'll tell you this, the rapture of the church, I do not believe, happens to all of the church. It happens to those who are prepared and who are looking for the rapture. 
It's just like anything, man. If you want to tap into it, you're going to have to believe in it. Now, I think, I think when the Bible says when Jesus was talking that there's two in one bed and one's taken, and there's two in the field and there's one taken, I don't think he's talking about a, a Christian and a non-Christian. I think that he's talking about a prophetic Jesus is coming back believing Christian and another Bible-thumping Christian who just says someday. Anyway, I'm, I'm not supposed to be teaching on that tonight. So Revelation chapter 1, Brother John is on the island of Patmos. I have been to the island of Patmos, and it is nothing but a rock. There's no trees on it. All those Greek islands, I love those Greek islands for the most part, except for people walking around naked out there. I don't appreciate that. You folk need to get some clothes on, I promise you. And in the, they do. They just get naked for no reason. And it's the people that have no business getting naked that always want to get naked. <laughs> Greeks are crazy, man. So the island of Patmos is a rock. There's no trees on it. And what kept prisoners on the island of Patmos is that it was a community for the blind. They're like, what are you talking about? I'm talking about that when the Romans put you on this island, they told you you need to do a 360 and you need to look around. And then they held you down and poked your eyes out and then said, yeah, you ain't never leaving this island because nobody else is ever going to help you. So unless John was the exception to that rule, it means everything he saw in the book of Revelation, he saw without physical eyes. And the key in the first, in the first chapter is, I heard a voice behind me, and I turned to see the voice. And he's so blown away with everything he is seeing. And he writes it all down. It's, an, it's a fascinating thought. And it blew me away when I was there. I was like, I'd never heard that. I've never heard anybody preach that before. That's incredible. Well, in the, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, he begins talking to the seven churches. And the seven churches are indeed seven churches. I mean, they're, they, they were real churches, and they were real congregations and real groups and bodies and tribes of Christians in seven different cities of what at that time was called Asia. We don't, call it, we don't call it Asia anymore. We actually call it Turkey, okay? And uh, any of you guys ever been to Turkey? You guys ever been there? Man, I have too, man. I love Turkey, man. I love tracking around out there, man. And to go to ancient Ephesus, incredible, incredible. And, and so, man, whenever you, whenever you look at these seven churches, not only were they seven real churches, but they were also seven figurative churches. And... They, there's tons of layers of revelation that, that go with that. I mean, people talk about seven different church ages and that we are in the last church age, which is the Laodicean age, or the, the age that is represented by the church of Laodicea, which is the church that Jesus ain't even in anymore. He's on the outside standing at the door and knocking and trying to get back in, right on? And, and, and I'm not saying that there are no Christian churches because there certainly are Jesus-loving churches, but, but that this represents an age of where there's a lot of Christianity that has nothing to do with Jesus. There's a lot of Christians that, that Jesus is going to say, oh, we never met. But I was a Christian my whole life. Yeah, how'd that, how'd that work out for you? You were supposed to be in love with me. You're supposed to be fascinated with me. You're supposed to be interested in me. You're supposed to fear me. You were supposed to have my priorities. You were supposed to have my heart. You were supposed to have my spirit. And you did really good at doing the church thing. Laodicea, right? Now, look, I'm, I'm not going to preach mean tonight, so y'all don't worry. I'm just, I'm just speaking truth. Amen? Well, whenever, whenever 25 years ago, whenever I, I decided we were actually going to have a church, I thought, man, what can I name this? And so I went through the seven churches, and I got to, there was on, there's only two churches out of the seven that Jesus doesn't give a spanking. And so five of the seven, he gives a big time spanking to. And the other two that he doesn't give a spanking, he, he talks to them, and one of them, he just, the Lord's like, I just can't believe you're still standing, okay? And then the other one, he's really impressed with their love for God and how they demonstrate their love for God through how they love people. 
Okay? And that church is the Church of Philadelphia. And so the Church of Philadelphia means the Church of Brotherly Love, right? You guys with me on that, right? So, so we know that. And I was going through that and I was like, Lord, this is, I think this is the, out of all the seven churches, I think that this is the one that we want to be. And in that, while he's talking to the faithful church or the church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, it says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy and who is true, who has the key of David, and he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. And that's why we're called Open Door Church. It's because of that scripture right there. I, I just like, you know what? I want to be famous for how we love people. And I want to be, I, I don't want to be famous for who I stand against. I want to be famous for how, for how we love people and as a tribe and as a body. Can I just tell you this? All of the speakers who came to our conference last week, without exception, were so blown away, not with me, but with you. And just said, I'm telling you right now, Troy, your, your church and the people that you run around with, the, this congregation that you, is so different. You guys really do love each other, and it's crazy. It's crazy how hard you guys work. It's crazy. It's like, we need to be around this. We need this. Like, hallelujah. Amen. Well, it's the church of Philadelphia that is the church of brotherly love or the church that, that demonstrates their love for God by how they are willing to love other people. That's a big deal. But this whole thing about the open door is actually something about something that's called the key of David. And the key of David is a remarkable mystery throughout the Word of God that obviously is connected to the throne of David, and it gains or stops supernatural access to things. Now, I want you to think about the importance of supernatural access or actually closing a door supernaturally so that something can't get to you anymore, or opening a door right? So that, so that you can step into something. Now, I want you to think about that. So opportunities for, for bad things to get to you are closed through the key of David and opportunities to get into the places that you need to be and with the people that you need to be with to give you access to the things that God wants to give you to. Those doors are opened by something that is known as the key of David. Are you, are you guys tracking with me? And Jesus says, I'm the one who holds the key of David. So not only is Jesus the door, Jesus is also the key to the door. Okay, so this whole thing is a big deal to me because a big part of the favor that the Lord has upon you will be demonstrated through the doors that he opens for you. But I'm, what I'm going to talk to you about is it's also demonstrated through the doors that God closes for you. And I talk a lot about open doors, and I'm going to continue to talk a lot about open doors, but we're going to end up, to, we're, we're going to end up talking about the power of closed doors and, and how important that, that is. The key of David, yeah, I love the key of David. That, key of David is also a musical thing. If I tune my guitar, I'm going to tune it to 440 tuning. Okay, so if, guys, are, guys are, there any, are there any musicians in here? 440, right? So when you tune... When you tune an instrument, you tune it to 440. Thank you. You are a musician back there. I see. Yeah, that's you, man. <laughs> and yeah, he's on our worship team. I was like, please raise your hand. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and we tune, to four, we, turn, we tune to a standard that is called 440. However, that was changed in the 1800s from 444. And up into the 1800s, the standard tuning for all instruments of the world was set at 444 tuning. And you're like, well, what, is, what does that have to do with anything? Because it comes from Israel. And the reason why it comes from Israel is because a thousand years before Jesus, whenever David set up the tabernacle, David's tabernacle, and gave everyone access to the Ark of the Covenant and the manifest presence of God, he had 24-7 worship going on. You guys know about the Ark of the Covenant, and you know about the tabernacle of David. That's that Amos 9-11 scripture that says in the last days. He actually says in that day. Anybody think of a day that's called 9-11? Okay. Amos 9-11 says, in that day, I will reestablish the tabernacle of David. Now, look, I believe that the third temple is going to be built. I do believe that, and it's a, it's a big part of the key of the Antichrist and all that kind of stuff. 
But it's not what God wants. God is not looking for, to rebuild Solomon's temple. He is looking to rebuild David's tabernacle where everybody has access. Everybody has access. Men and women and boys and girls and white people and black people and brown people and whatever shade of Heinz 57 you are, or rich people and poor people, where we all have access to the manifest presence of God. Well, when he started that, a thousand years before King Jesus, he trained musicians to play, and he, he is the guy who is in charge of bringing ten stringed instruments. Guitars. Okay? So David is a rock star. And when David brings all of his stringed instruments, they have to decide what a standard tuning is. And David set it at 444, the key of David. So the key of David is actually a sound. Now, every time God comes back and changes anything, there's a sound that goes with it. Are y'all with me? So the key of David is, but is there anybody here that you've been seeing 444 all over the place? Yeah, key of David. That's what that is. What about you? You've been, you've been seeing it all over the place? Anybody in here that's seen 444 in a dream recently? I want to just ask you that. Yep. Really, because that's some, some people, man, I keep seeing 444 in a dream. I keep seeing it. Like, what is that? It's the key of David. It's King Jesus himself saying, you have qualified to enter into some places that I'm opening a door now for. That's what the key of David is. Now, I love that, and I think that that's really cool. And when God opens up the doors, that's a really big deal. I know that one of the things that we're looking at this year, uh, uh, Brother Henderson gave a prophetic word at my 2020 conference where he said this is the year of the double open door. You remember that? Okay. Well, hello, open door. Right on. So it is a double a double anointing for an open door. So we're talking about a double portion of, of, the, of the key of David. And, and, where, and where will you find that? You will find that among people who love people. The Church of Philadelphia. Okay? He doesn't offer it to everybody else. He offers it to the Church of Philadelphia. People who have selfless acts of redemption. And they are laying down their lives for people that it's never going to benefit them for them to lay down their lives. Okay, so that's us, that's our tribe, that's what we're doing, and that's real, okay? Now, whenever, whenever you see a double door opened up or a double anointing for something or a year that is like, I don't know, 2020, okay? Whenever you see that, one of the scriptures that you can point to that shows us what, what's happening there is actually Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45 is the King Cyrus scripture. That's the, that's the King Cyrus chapter. And you need to know Isaiah chapter 45 because prophetically it's huge for, for right now. Okay, by the way, well, let's just read it. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. Okay, a Cyrus is, is, is typically an ungodly person that is employed by the kingdom. That's what a Cyrus is. You, you guys know that, right? So what that means is, is somebody that the kingdom employs and says, you are going to live for the benefit of my people, particularly Israel. Right? Okay. And by the way, it, he, he is a guy that God will use a double door anointing for. Now, King Cyrus was a Persian, which means he was an Iranian, and he was a strange dude because of the influence that Daniel had on him. He was flat out scared of Daniel. And he had good reason to be because he tried to kill him. Now, he didn't want to, but he was a political puppet and he got messed up. And you know the whole story of Daniel and the lion's den, right? He ended up being the one that after 70 years said, I am going to let all the Jews go back from this terrible place back to Israel and I'm going I'm to allow that to happen. And so the Lord used him. 
He was not a godly person. He didn't talk kingdom speech, but he had people that were key prophetic voices in his life, and he feared the Lord because of that. And then he did things that greatly benefited Israel. Okay, all right, it's Isaiah what? Okay, President Trump is what? Yeah, yeah. And since my entire life, I have been hearing every single president I have ever voted for say, we will make Jerusalem the capital of Israel. And then the Muslims showed up and they all got scared. That joker don't care. He doesn't care. I could go on and on and on about all that. But the bottom line is this, and this is one of the reasons you have to understand how God will employ non-kingdom people for kingdom things. You have to understand that. All right, well, whenever you see God doing that, and by the way, Israel came out with a coin. They call him Cyrus, and it's Trump on one side, and it's Cyrus on the other side. I've seen the actual coin. I mean, I've seen it. Like, oh, my gosh. Okay, so that is a prophetic word to you that the key of David is being activated. That's, that's what that means to you, and it's when the double doors are opened. All right. So I love the whole thing of open door. And I can see right now, guys, that the Lord is opening up doors to us. Can y'all see that? And it's such a big deal, and I'm so grateful for it. But I don't want you to miss the power of a closed door either. And today, when my team was looking up stuff for the closed door, one of the first things that we discovered is that there's 26 instances in Scripture where a door is shut. There's 26 different stories where the Bible specifically says, and the door was shut. 26 is the number for David. 26 is the number for David. It means beloved. The word beloved is in the Bible 26 times. So again, the key of David doesn't just open doors. The key of David also closes doors. And one of the things that you're going to find in this tremendous season and era of the Lord opening up brand new doors is he is absolutely slamming doors behind you. And you have to be okay with that. And y'all know, y'all know that whole thing of when you walk into a room and the, and, and, and the wind catch the door and bam, it slams behind you. And that's a scary thing. Now, I don't know if y'all jump like a cat, but I do. And I'm like, oh, oh what, you know, what, what just happened? It freaks me out. Loud noises freak me out. Like, ah. And so you know, that, okay, well, that, that's happening right now. And you can have a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety if you're not wise in the things of the Spirit right now. And I just want you to be wise. I want you to be smart about this. You do not freak out that these people that you've been friends with for 30 years no longer want to be your friend. Boom, the door's shut. Why? Because they can't go into this place with you. And if you decide you're going to go play with your friends, you're going to miss the thing that God Almighty has for you. Well, I've always worked for this company, and this is how I've always, I've always made money. Bam! Like, what just happened? God just shut the door. He just shut the door. Why? Because you've gone as far as you can go in that realm, and God's, gonna, God's not even going to give you access to that anymore. And he's going to put you in a whole new place. It's the power of a closed door. Now, there's, there's tons of, again, there's 26 in, instances of, of, a, of a closed door within the Bible. And remember, guys, the key of David doesn't just open doors that no man can shut, the key of David also closes doors that no man can open. And that's huge. So we're looking, and I'm going through this, and looking at when does God close the door. One of the, one of the biggest keys, or one of the first big um, understandings of it, you need to pay attention when God closes the door, is the ark. I'm talking about Noah's ark. And I don't know if you realize this or not, but they didn't close the door. God closed the door. And they got, they, they got in the ark, and God went, bam! And then they sit there for seven days before the rain came. Okay? In Revelation chapter 4, the Bible says, And I saw a door open in heaven, and I heard a voice saying, Come up here, come up here. Y'all remember that? And that's the rapture of the church is what that is. Okay? How many days did they sit there in the ark before everything changed? Seven. Okay, 
All right. I don't know if you caught that or not. If you see the picture of that, that picture is all the way through the Word of God over and over and over again. And I know that there are a lot smarter people than me that do not believe in the rapture of the church. And then the people who are like, well, I believe in it. I just believe it's going to happen right the second before Jesus comes back. That is weak and lazy and pathetic theology. It's lazy faith. I mean, it's just there's no courage in that. I deserve to go through all this hell, and I deserve all this, and Jesus is going to call me up, and then, and then, and then I'm going to come right back. Okay, you can if you want to. But when the Lord closes the door, he shows the picture that there's a seven after he closes it. How many years are the, how many years are the tribulation, guys? Seven. So I, I have, and for people who are, are telling me now, you, you're not reading that in the Bible. You're just from the hillbilly south, and everybody believes in a pre-trib rapture. You don't, you don't want to mess with me. So I don't care if you believe in it or not. I'm just telling you, you'll miss it if you don't believe in it. That's what I'm telling you. And I, I don't think the Lord wants you to miss that. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And Jesus said, Jesus gave a parable and said, let me talk to you about 10 people who are engaged and looking for their wedding night with the king. And five of them were foolish. And five of them were wise. Do y'all remember that story? And guys, do you, do you know what somebody is foolish? Do you know what that means? It, means? it means not believing. The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. So foolishness has to do with not having faith. Wisdom has to do with having faith. Now, he didn't say there were five prostitutes and five brides. He said, no, there's ten brides. There's ten virgins. They're all godly people. But five of them are foolish and they don't have their act together. Amen. And then what happens? While they are out trying to get their act together, the bridegroom shows up and he closes the door. He closes the door. And they are at the door, knocking on the door, saying, please, please, please let us in. Do you remember that? He's like, uh-uh, you missed it. You missed it. But don't worry, I'll show up seven years from now. In Genesis chapter 19, we see the whole story of Lot. And I want to tell you, Larry Randolph gave such an outstanding word last week, man, when he was talking about, we will not listen to Job's wife. I said, man, why don't you just give up and die? Why don't you just give up? Just, just give up and die and let's just get it over with. This whole God thing has done nothing but driven us crazy from day one. It's like, we ain't listening to Job's wife. And we're also not listening to Lot's wife. What was Lot's problem? She was transitionally challenged. When God showed up and said, it's time for you to leave this place, and it's time for you to go to that place, she couldn't do it. So she became a monument to the way things used to be. She turned into a pillar of salt, and she turned back, meaning I cannot transition. Hey, listen, you don't want to miss your transition right now. Okay, and so what you you actually need the key of David to close the door behind you. It's a whole lot like water baptism. Guys, water baptism, then the symbol of that is actually um, in the book of Exodus, whenever whenever brother Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and brought them across the Red Sea. And you all know the whole story. They go in the water. Pharaoh goes in the water. They come out of the water. And Pharaoh stays in the water. And that's what baptism is. And Paul even says this, brother I, brother, I would not have you to be ignorant. And then he says, do you not know that Israel was baptized unto Moses? He's like, this is what baptism is all about. It's about going in the water. You take the thing that has always enslaved you with you in the water. You come out of the water. And the thing that has always enslaved you stays in the water. Okay. All right, well, let me tell you what that is also a picture about. I, because, guys, whenever the Lord closed the door at the crossing of the Red Sea, it didn't just keep Pharaoh from coming after them. It kept them from going back. They didn't have a way to go back. And that's why many times, man, we need that door closed. Because there comes a time when we start smelling them Egyptian onions. And you know that Bible story, right? They're like, you know what? 
I, I know that man was bad to me and he broke my heart, but man, he was something else. Mm-hmm. You something else. And you've been on Prozac for 20 years because of that mess. And you start to, you're starting to think, maybe, man, that, that onion's starting to smell good again. I think I'm going to track right back to Egypt. Well, good luck with that once the Red Sea has been closed. You, you'd better keep going forward or you're going to die where you're at. In the wilderness, not seeing the promise. Man, I think I'm preaching good. That's what I think. Well, in... In Genesis 19, whenever they're at Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels show up and say, hey, we're, we're not teasing. Y'all need to get out of town. And all this stuff happens. The bad guys show up at the door. And I want you to catch this. I want y'all to look at verse 9, if you would, please. And they said, stand back. And they said, this one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as some kind of a judge over us. Now we're going to deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot, and they came near to break down the door. But the men, we're talking about the angels of the Lord, but the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. Okay. I want to tell you one of the things that happens when the Lord begins to grant you access and begins to deny access to your enemies to you is he releases angels to do that. And there, there is angelic assignment that comes for the performance of the word of God where God says, okay, Troy's done with that and angels will show up in Troy's life and begin closing the doors to things that I otherwise would have had access to and those things would have had access to me. And that's the way it works with all of us. Friends, we, we need to learn hardcore how to pronounce the Word of God, how to speak the Word of God, how to live the Word of God, how to demonstrate the Word of God, and make it easy for our angels to do their job. Amen. Amen. Sure do. So, so these angels were warning a lot of impending doom. God never leaves us without a warning. We know that that's real. Now, I want to show you this. In Matthew chapter 25, it says, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. That is that same exact scripture I was telling you about, and that is the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is the rapture of, the, rapture of the church to be with Jesus. It's the party where we all sit at the same table. It is that. And again, I just want to tell you, you don't want the door shut on you on that. Amen. You have to be ready. You have to be living that life. You have to be looking for that. You have to be actively involved in that. You have to partner with the Lord for that. In Luke chapter 13, verse 25, when once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open to us, he'll answer and say to you, I, I, don't, I don't know where you've been. I don't know what's going on with y'all. You have an entirely different agenda than I have right now. And you missed your day of visitation. Okay. All right. So I say that, and I want you guys to, to turn now with me, if you would, please, to, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to go down to 2 Kings chapter 4. In 2 Kings chapter 4, we have the incredible story of Elijah uh, and the widow's oil. And he blessed the wife of a prophet who had been murdered by bringing her enormous wealth, okay, incredible wealth. And this is what he did. He said, you know what? She's like, well, yeah, look, man, we're about to die. We're so poor, we can't even pay attention. It's over. And he's like, okay, I'll tell you what. I want you to gather all your pots. And actually, you don't have enough pots. You need to go borrow pots from a bunch of other people. And you need to have a whole bunch of pots because, because they're going to supernaturally be filled with oil. And you're going into the oil business. Amen. And we know that that's what happened, but check this out. He says in 2 Kings, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you. I want to tell you, this miracle does not happen unless there is a door that is shut behind them. There's all kinds of miracles in the Bible that do not happen unless the door is shut behind them. And you begin to see this in the Word of God. And once you begin to see this pattern, you begin to not panic when you see doors being shut behind you. You say, Lord, I don't know what's going on. Your, your miracle's coming. Because that miracle cannot happen. And guys, this is a business 
miracle. And I promise you that this is so real that when you begin to partner with God, you begin to be a kingdom person concerning your business, he will close doors behind you and then he will bless you financially. This is a business move is what this is. She's literally going into the oil business and she didn't even have any oil. She didn't even have pots and pans to put the oil in. She had to go borrow them. Anybody ever had to start a business? You had to go borrow some money? Okay, well, do you remember what Larry Randolph said? I'm going to be quoting him for a long time, man. Larry Randolph said that there is a rain that is coming from God that we have never seen before. And the size of the anointing that the Lord has for us and the size of the animals or the things that he brings to us is in direct proportion to the size of the ark you and I are willing to build. Her miracle, her miracle came in direct proportion of the size of how many pots was was she willing to bring into the house before she finally got wore out? Because she didn't see any oil until it was all over with, and then she closed the door and said, I'm done looking for pots. Do you understand that she went out like a crazy woman asking everybody, listen, God told me that there's a miracle that's going to take place, and I just cannot have your pots and pans because because I'm I'm, I'm fixing to go in the oil business, and and business is booming, and it's going to be incredible. And can I borrow that one? Hey, there's one, there's one, there's one. There came a point where she decided that's enough. And God was just going to just go, I don't care. I don't care if it's 10 million. He says, let me know. You're going to let me know when to release your miracle because you're going to come in the house and you're going to shut the door. I, I wonder what, what miracle, and I, I keep feeling somebody touch me <laughs> right now. I keep feeling somebody going, that, that's a good boy. Hallelujah. It's, it's happened several times since I've been standing right here. <laughs> so what is I wonder what miracle God has for you when, because you, you have believed him, you have prepared, you've brought it in the house, and then you've shut the door and said, all right, your turn. I've, I've done everything, God, that you told me to do. And I'm closing the door, I'm shutting the door, I'm done. And I'm not doing any more business with anybody. Now I'm doing business with you. What's going to happen? One, one of the things that... that I don't know if you guys have saw our prayer video that we prayed several years, that, that we made several years ago. Um, it was before I had the ranch when we, I was living in that little bitty tiny house and, and I was showing people, well, this is how I pray. And I have, I, I have different rooms that I pray different things in because I'm a crazy person. But a big part of it is I have a war room where I go in there and cry out to God and bring, bring the attention of all the anxiety that I have, the mess that is going on, the 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 halls of haters that we've all got to walk through and all that mess and all that kind of stuff. But then when I brought all that to the Lord, I literally walk outside the room and I slam the door. And I'm leaving it in there. Now I'm going to go into worship. I'm, I'm not going to go into worship with a long list of things that I'm freaked out over. I need my pleasure to be before the Lord when I'm in worship or else it's not true worship. Right on. So I will literally slam the door. I will, I will physically go into a room and just go in there, and it's just like you just, it's kind of just like you throw up. Ah! I don't know what that looks like for you, but I promise you it's ugly for me. My God, did you, did you see that? Can you believe that happened? Ah! And get all this, Lord, you tell me to bring these things before you. I don't know why you want to deal with this stuff, because I don't want to deal with it. But I'm bringing it to you. This is happening, that's happening, this has happened. We got these people to rescue. We got these houses to build. We got this water crisis going on in this nation. We got this, 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 this. And folk in a church are mad because we don't have nothing green on the stage. They're crazy people. I got, I, help, help. All right, then shut the door and go, I I brought it. I brought it. He told me to bring it. Okay. He told me to do that. Now I'm going to shut the door and I'm going to go into another room now 
Open the door, and I am bringing my pleasure to the Lord. God, I'm so glad I can come to you. Sure do love you, sir. Sure do. I'm so grateful that I have you in my life. It's the power of closing a door. And when you close it as a prophetic act, God responds. All right, so now that I've been saying this, is there any crazy people in here you've been hearing doors close? Yeah. Okay, I want you to think about that. Because you're like, whoa, whoa, stop. Oh, my God, I have. Well, yeah, I know. And, and that's not even crazy. Wait till I start talking about crazy stuff. <laughs> Literally be sitting there minding my own business, and bam, I hear a door close. I go, okay, Lord, no more access. That devil don't have access to me. Thank you, sir. Thank you, King Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for that. Like, what was that? Oh, it's just... You know, doors open and close around here all the time. It's just this weird Kia David thing. It's no big deal. Amen. The power of closing a door behind you is so important. Okay, dead things come back to life behind closed doors. What are you talking about? Elijah and the Shunanite woman. So God had done this incredible miracle with this woman who... She plugged into his ministry, and she partnered with him, and she went way out of her way to partner with this prophet. And he said, what do you want? And she said, well, I can't have a baby. He said, you can now. And he timed it. He said, about this time next year, man, you're going to be bouncing a baby boy on that knee right there. Right? You guys know the story? And then he comes down. He wants to go see his friend. He wants to check on his boy. He finds out the brother had died. This is years later. He died. And she's heartbroken. And he goes in the house, and, and this young man is literally dead. And I want you to pay attention to what it says. When Elijah came into the house, there was the child lying dead on the bed. And he went in there, therefore, and he shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Now, why is it, why is it important for him to go in there and close the door? I want you to think about that. I want you to think about, okay, there's something that's going to happen in this room, and this room is sacred space, and I'm not giving the world access to this room right now. This is the power of sacred space. This is the power of consecrated holy territory, and I'm shutting the door in order to see this resurrection happen. I wonder what, I wonder, I wonder if, I wonder if your marriage needs to be resurrected. I wonder if your relationship with your kids needs to be resurrected. Like, well, it's been dead a long time, Pastor. Well, maybe you need to shut the door. And maybe, maybe you need to have a sacred space between you and God for it to be on earth as it is in heaven. And that's not a big, huge space. That's an intimate place where you shut the door and there's something going on between you and God and you call that place holy. Mind you, when the door was open, that was a place of tragedy. It was a place of heartbreak. It was a place of horror. It was a place of nightmares until he went in there and shut the door and said, no, we're changing this. I remember, I remember Gina Zagara, Pastor, Pastor AJ's daddy. How many of you guys know Pastor Gene? You don't know that, brother? I remember 20 some odd years ago, I was invited down to her house when AJ was a little boy. And I went down there and they had this big last supper. Like, what you talking about? I'm talking about Gene had a brain tumor, and he wanted to have his last supper because he was going in a room, and he was closing the door, and he was fasting and praying until either he died or he was healed. I thought that was awesome. I thought that was hilarious. Now, mind you, all my friends that were there, because they're a very dramatic group of people, crying, crying. I'm I'm just like, what? This is awesome. He's like, he's coming up to me, Vato, listen, I'm going in that room, bro, and I'm going to find the presence. He does that. He'll be talking real soft, and he screams for no reason. I don't know if you know he does that. <laughs> I'm like, okay. All right, cool. And I want to tell you something about Gene as a I stayed up. I had a bunch of guys over at my house last night, and we stayed up all night long telling Gene stories. Just the amazing things that I've seen God do through Gina Zagara. And this is one of them. That brother, he told everybody, this is my last supper. 
I want to tell you all I love you and I bless you and I call you blessed. And they all had a party. He said, all right, I'm going in that room. And that brother went in the room and shut the door. And it was over. He come out some 20 some odd days later, not having eaten a single thing and said, Jesus told me I'm healed. And that brother was healed of a brain tumor. Yeah. Well, that's not something, man, you invite everybody in on. Right? You don't need everybody's opinion. Well, it must be the Lord's will. That, you, you joker, get away from me. Hey, how many brain tumors are there in heaven? That's how you can tell if it's God's will or not. Just, I know that cuts right through your religious noggin and doesn't make any sense, but I'm telling you right now, oh, all this horror in hell must be God's will. No, it's because the people of God will not get up and be the people of God. And, and say, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. If you don't see any cancer in heaven, then there should be no cancer here. Amen. So don't you dare for one second, if you fight some kind of a cancer, a cancer battle, don't you think for one second, well, it must be the Lord doing this or allowing this to happen because I need to be punished. That is baloney. Amen. You're redeemed. You're a child of the living God. Amen. Amen. And cancer does not belong to your body. You know what? You are healed. You're healed. I tell you, if you're going to ask me why I think the Lord allowed this to happen, just so you could get a really cool wig. I know. Don't be throwing your wigs at me. Crazy people. Okay, so is there any doubt in your mind, do you have any doubt at all, that God's stamp of approval is upon this cancer that has come against your body? Do you have any doubt of that? No. Because his stamp of approval is not on that. And so you have to close the door to that and go, uh-uh. There's just some places I ain't going, and there's some things I ain't letting in to this room of this battle. No room, no access whatsoever. You have to close the door on it. Everybody stretch your hands towards my sister. God, I just want to lift up angel. Man, I feel the Lord. Oh, God, I feel you so much. Father God, I thank you, God, that this is the moment of her healing. And I just speak and declare you will live and not die and declare the testimonies of the Most High God. I declare the Father's love over you in Jesus' name and declare the blood of Jesus over your entire physical body that you will see your babies grow up and be old. You're going to see that happen. And just declare in the name of King Jesus that no weapon formed against you shall prosper and that this thing will not continue. It will not go any further in Jesus' name. And that cancer dies in the name of Jesus. We call call your body a cancer-free zone in Jesus' name because of the heart of the Father and and because of the will of God towards you that you are healed in Jesus' name. The lion has roared and we declare your healing in Jesus' name. Amen. I've known Angel for a long time, uh, and she married one of my childhood friends, uh, Billy Jenkins. And Billy and I were friends, you know, elementary school a little bit. We were, we were in Cub Scouts together, and uh, uh, Weebelows, you know, yeah. Anybody remember Weebelows? I mean, I'm talking about, man, we were in that when we were little bitty, bitty kids. And I want to tell you, I thought Angel was so cool when I first met her, because I'm not making this up. She literally was a roller derby chick. And beat up girls with roller skates on. <laughs> I was like, Billy's going to marry that woman. How can you resist a roller derby chick? <laughs> Insanity. Like, wow. I'm going to close by saying that whenever Jesus healed and resurrected from the dead, he closed the door. You guys remember that? And then I also would like to, to, to remind you that the secret place requires a shut door. Matthew 6, 6. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father. I mean, he literally says, I want to hear a door shut. Think about that for a minute, and think about how real that is. 
Well, I'm going to, the very last scripture that I'm going to give you is in John, it starts in John chapter 20, and in 19 it says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be to you. The Bible goes out of its way to say, it happened in a place where the doors were shut. Now, the 2020 scripture of that is he showed them his scars and they were glad it was him. That's 2020. <laughs> this is a 2020 year. Friends, in verse 25, it says, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside and this time Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, there it is again, the doors being shut and stood in their midst and said, peace be to you. Peace be to you literally means don't freak out. It like shows up. Yeah. See, there, there are ways that God wants to enter in that are through open doors, but there are ways that God wants to enter in that require there to be closed doors. So, don't be afraid of the doors that King Jesus is closing behind you. It's a part of going to the next level. It's just a part of it. Guys, let's give King Jesus a great big praise in the house. Let's do that. Amen. Right on.